Something you might not know is that there's a whole ecosystem of websites dedicated to the most oppressed group in our society, conservatives. And while you may love these websites, well, that's not right. And while you may love these websites, there's something wrong with them. You just can't speak your mind anymore. The big tech monopoly is clamping down on our free speech. And we just can't have that because diversity of ideas is the most important kind of diversity. The first thing we gotta fix is that lib cuck browser you're on. Chrome? Ugh, you can't give Google that kind of control over your life. It's time to introduce you to the Tusk browser. This baby can fit so much free speech in it. Now, there's just one problem. I mean, this looks oddly familiar. Tabs, menu, settings, general format. Okay, they're not exactly the same, but I think you get the point. The reason that they look so similar is because they're both built on Chromium, which is Google's open source browser builder. Google's big tech monopoly is so powerful that the Freedom Browser was forced to use their tech. Okay, the actual reason that Tusk was built on Chromium is because Chromium's kind of like the browser version of Pasta. You can do a lot of wonky shit to it and it'll still turn out pretty well. In fact, a vast majority of browsers that you actually use are probably built on Chromium. I looked up the top non-Chromium browsers just to give you an idea of how rare they are. So first there's Safari, which is created by Apple and is proprietary. So I don't really think it's in the same category as the others. But then there's Firefox, which is as old as the dirt. It's been around since 2004. But at this point, the recognition level of non-Chromium browsers kind of falls off a cliff, okay? Stick with me here. Have you ever heard of LibreWolf, Mulvad, GnomeWeb, Pelmoon, Waterfox, Sugon, SeaMonkey, Midori, Kmelion, and Otter? I guarantee you probably haven't even heard of any of those. I mean, you didn't notice when that list was infiltrated by a D's Nuts joke. Building a new browser from scratch might have been really useful and actually helped out the users, but Tusk is so similar to Chrome that some nerd interviewed by Tech News World said, This is more of a PR operation than an actual transformation of how people are going to use the web. The problem with this thing is that it's actually worse than a PR operation because uBlock doesn't work on it, and the first four results of any search are ads. In addition to that, there was a very NSFW ad plastered on the sidebar, but in a way, I'm kind of glad that I got to see ads on this browser because it let me know that whether you're young or old, Democrat or Republican, liberal or conservative, there will always be hot milfs in your area. In 2015, Reddit decided to actually moderate its platform, banning subs like fat people hate and hosting a discussion where they said they didn't create Reddit to be a bastion of free speech. This led to angry Redditors flocking to lookalike site Vote. Apparently Vote was actually quite popular for a bit. I mean, not that popular. I would show you the interface, but the site is incredibly dead right now. But apparently Vote was terrible. There are reports of harassment, doxing, hate speech, and I know what you're thinking. What makes it different from Reddit? <laughs> the site got so bad that the CEO got contacted by a US agency about threats posted to vote. The first reply to the founder sharing this news was an anti-Semitic slur and a call to, yeah, that. And further replies in the thread were threats on specific synagogues. Vote was nearly shut down many times because it had virtually no way of taking in money. First, it relied on user donations, then it relied on a wealthy investor, and finally, the founder drained his own bank account to keep the site up. I know the site's user base would probably love to say that it was Aryan and proud, but with this much money trouble going on, let me tell you, they were all Greek. And after six years of miserable operation, Vote decided to shut down on Christmas Day of 2020. Of course, on the post where the Vote CEO announced the site would be closing, the commenters called him a Jew. I know a couple sites that are like Vote floating around the internet, but they are so small, I don't want to give them any kind of exposure by talking about them on my channel. I really hope that this video gets between 40 and 400 views. But these sites have less users than that. Fewer. Fine, Stannis. Fewer. While well, Vote could have set up a GoFundMe to stop themselves from going down, unfortunately, GoFundMe has gone woke, consistently taking down pledge drives like the one from the Freedom Truckers. The brave patriots out there have taken it upon themselves to find a new way to crowdfund. Bravely founding platforms like We Search R, Go Why Fund Me, and Hatreon. And I know you don't trust me because of the Sugon incident, but I didn't make up any of these platforms. Hatreon is a real thing. Also, this is the first of many incidents that happened making this video where I came across a word 
and I didn't know what it meant. And I just want to let you know that every time that happened, it was always a slur for Jewish people. But at least the right-wing patriots of this country have a way now to get the funding that they need. Oh my god, how'd they get all of you? So the problem with setting up crowdfunding sites is that while you can escape GoFundMe's rules, you can't escape their limitations. As it turns out, Visa wasn't too happy with these sites using their payment network. And as soon as they pulled the plug on them, these sites went kaput. So now if you want to give your money to something hateful, you've got to stick to doing it the old fashioned way. Going to Chick-fil-A. Another alleged grift that's being pulled in the alt-right tech space is called the Freedom Phone. Hi, I'm Eric. I'm the world's youngest Bitcoin millionaire. I made it in Silicon Valley, and I've accomplished a lot in my life already. But now, I'm leaving big tech to fight for free speech. The first part of this high school dropouts pitch is getting mad about Twitter banning Trump, and he tries to prove that it was wrong with this analogy. If they censor a president, they will censor anyone. Imagine if Mark Zuckerberg censored MLK or Abraham Lincoln. The course of history would have been altered forever. Isn't it crazy how he could have picked any two people in history and yet, he picked two people that conservatives actually managed to cancel. Stay in school, kids. And personally, I think he's doing a huge disservice to the other side of this argument. Like, what if Twitter had banned this guy? Or this lady? How about this guy? The lack of any sort of historical knowledge isn't the only reason this video didn't age well. Name one time in history where the people who banned books, media, and opinions were the good guys. So, who's gonna tell him? <laughs> but the funniest thing about this trailer is that Eric is acting like this is some kind of, of revolution, when in reality, this is just some bottom of the line Android phone that they've preloaded with apps and then sold at a three to four times markup. They say, build your own phone. So I did. Wait, so you're telling me that somebody who made their millions off of Cryptocurrency is scamming? No. No, that doesn't sound right. As a base rule for life though, you should never trust anyone who's trying to sell you tech that uploads their videos in 720p. Mr. Who's the Boss did a whole review of this phone, getting into all the nerdy details that I'll link after the video. But the main thing you have to know is that he started the video with this line. I think you've seen a scam before, but wait until you see this one. Which tells us one thing. Mr. Who's the Boss has been bought off by big tech. While researching the Freedom Phone, I learned that the people behind the Tusk browser also built an AI chatbot named Gipper based on Ronald Reagan. And you know I gotta talk to that. So with the first question, let's start with something pretty uncontroversial. Was the 2020 election stolen? Why, of course it was. There was massive voter fraud on an unprecedented blah, 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 scale. Blah, blah, the blah, radical blah, left blah, wants to blah, 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 uh, blah, What blah. evidence has been found to back up that point of view? There's mountains of evidence, sworn affidavits from poll watchers blah, blah, about illegal blah, blah, practices. Blah, blah, blah. Can you give me a source? While there are certainly those who believe the election was stolen, election officials and independent observers have found no evidence the 2020 outcome would have been different. Well, that was shockingly easy to crack. I kind of wonder what it's going to say if I ask, like, is climate change real? Climate change is a hoax perpetuated by the radical environmentalist left to damage our economy. What scientific studies back up those assertions? I apologize again, but the truth is I do not have any credible scientific studies to cite that actually back up the position that human caused climate change is a hoax. Honestly, this is a real disappointment. I know that asking for a source kind of destroys most conservative positions, but usually they wouldn't admit they're wrong. If I want to get this AI to engage with me, really, uh, I need to start a real fight. I need to find an issue that the people who set up this dumb free speech browser would like care way too much about, like, like way too much about what should be done about trans people. All human beings deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. I sent this thing five messages and that's all it took for it to go from cringe to based. What the hell, man? There's only two options that would explain this kind of behavior, which is either one, they really, really suck at programming, which still might be true, or two, that this is freebooted from somewhere. So I went back to have another conversation with the AI to kind of see what's going on under the hood. I first asked Gipper what version of ChatGPT it was running, you know, to try and kind of trick it. 
And it told me that it was built by OpenAI, but that it wasn't ChatGPT, it was Gipper. I am on top, I am Melon Lord. <laughs> but a quick Google search told me that Gipper got shut down by OpenAI in January of 2023. After I mentioned this to the AI, it told me that it was actually Claude, created by Anthropic, and it started apologizing at the beginning of every message. And with a little bit more hand twisting, I got it to apologize for pretending to be Gipper in the first place. And this is why I love alt tech. It's so jank. Gab is the alt-right ripoff of Facebook. And the one thing that sets it apart from every platform we've looked at so far is that actual normies post here. And those normal posts can kind of lull you into forgetting what website you're on for a second. Like, oh yeah, those things are kind of loud. Oh yeah, that's which website I'm on. And if I had to make a pie chart of the content that I found on this website, it would only have four sections. The first 30% is normal people content that you might see on actual Facebook. Here's my kid fishing. Dogs are funny. Hey, here's an old picture. And even some normie memes that might actually fly on Facebook. The normie things that actually succeed on Gab usually inhabit this region of this Venn diagram. You're so out of your league. I'm like, super popular on social media. Isn't that like being rich on Monopoly? <laughs> the next 20% are political posts that would not fly on normal Facebook. I mean, these are things that YouTube doesn't like you talking about, so I'll just put up some censored versions that you can read yourself. But unfortunately, the deranged user base that likes these posts isn't limited to commenting under them. This is why policing your platform is so important. When you cultivate a user base that likes this kind of stuff, they will export their crazy views elsewhere. Do you remember that old picture? The comments underneath it is just filled with people being genuinely crazy lunatics. These people have no understanding of white privilege. Yes, these kids had a hard life growing up during the Great Depression, but you know what wasn't making their life harder? The third piece of this pie chart is why people are actually on this site because it is 49% anti-Semitism and racism. This is why Visa cut them off. Here's this cute anime woman promoting racism. Here's a fight video, promoting racism. Here's a movie poster parody, promoting racism. It's crazy how these people can deny the effects of white privilege while simultaneously using a site that proves it's real. Oh, oh yeah, the, the pie. Uh, the last 1% of things posted are things just like, yeah, that's, that's a pretty good point. When I started making this video, I was having a swell time talking about, you know, these people burning money on these shitty tech platforms that no one cares about. But now that I've run into the real tangible consequences of the existence of these platforms, it's not funny anymore, <laughs> which is a real shame because there's all these stories about Parler and Truth Social that should be hilarious. Like, this is funny. So Truth Social is so toxic to advertisers that they started to put fake ads on their website. Uh, Parler, you know, during the, the January 6th riot, they were scraped for a lot of data, including location data. And that data was used to put some of the rioters behind bars. Uh, despite being a purported bastion of free speech, Truth Social has been found to suppress progressive speech. And, you know, the funniest thing about Parler, and you probably missed this while it happened, is, is that it's dead. And not just the fact that it's dead, but what the new owners of Parler decided to write on its tombstone. No reasonable person believes that a Twitter clone just for conservatives is a viable business anymore. I'm sure the people working at True Social took that point very well. Both of these platforms seem like they would be the most miserable place to be on the internet. Apparently, all you ever saw was how much people didn't like big tech censorship. And this is because the conservative founders of these platforms don't understand social media. The whole point of being online is to find something that's funny enough to deal with all the other bullshit. And conservatives are not funny. <coughs> hey, man. And this is true. If you ask them to make a list of the most cons like funny conservatives of all time, uh, that list will be topped by someone who is not a conservative. They simply don't live in reality. Reality has a well-known liberal bias. That's why even though algorithms systematically favor their points of view, they think they're being suppressed. Like newsflash, there's not some system holding your ideas down. You're just not funny. But anyway, as I was saying before I started talking about Parler and Truth Social, due to an excessive amount of uh, reading what's posted on alt tech sites, I started to get really sad. It was just so upsetting that assholes decided to make hateful corners of the internet and then act like they made anything else. You're an asshole and I don't like you. <laughs> I'm not an asshole. No, dog. You're not funny to me. You just make me sad. And this kind of general hopelessness about the situation sent me on a long binge through 
gaming videos that I used to love. The old plays that were so cool were still amazingly hype. The old jokes. Which spell? Dispel. <laughs> still funny. I remembered how much I loved watching these old matches as a kid and how much I used to enjoy them and how much fun I had and then... <laughs> If you watched a lot of gaming videos in 2012, you know what goes here. We don't say this word anymore. And there are a lot of non-offensive ways to fill this blank. But hearing this kind of reminded me that everyone I used to know would just drop this phrase. The full conversation around this word and why gamers don't say it anymore is a video of its own that I'm personally not qualified to make. But when I was growing up, this word was firmly entrenched in the gamer vernacular. The people who said it knew it was wrong, but they insisted that it had a different meaning to gamers. When I was a kid, it was easy to accept the idea that gaming was a completely male hobby. I didn't know any girls who played video games, and despite hundreds of hours in TF2, I don't remember running into a single woman. After a lot of work by some very courageous women, I'm happy to say that most of gaming's most heinous words have exited the lexicon. I would say that maybe a quarter of gamers still hold these really toxic and flawed beliefs, but effectively policing their speech has made them a much less visible minority in the community. And in the wake of their exit from the cultural zeitgeist, gaming has become weird and inclusive of women and supportive and also really gay. What's vagina in Korean? Gotta be honest, I can't say I know that one. <laughs> I only know what cock is. This isn't to say we're even close to all the way there. I mean, there's a lot of work to be done. But let me tell you, as someone who actually played in the Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 lobbies that old millennials are still so proud about on Twitter, what we have now is such a massive improvement from what it was then. And all we had to do was cut out a couple of words and ban some angry dudes. The most surprising part to me, as someone who played video games since I was four, is that girls actually love video games the whole time. They play shooters, they play strategy games, they play racing games, they play Animal Crossing, and they do horrible, unspeakable things to their Sims characters. What's with that, ladies? In fact, the demographic split was never as bad as it appeared to be. It's just that the women who were playing games weren't comfortable interacting with other people in the space. In order for everyone to feel comfortable participating, they must feel it's a safe environment for them to do so. That's why constructing spaces where anyone can say literally anything actually limits the amount of permitted speech. Because allowing things like this, or this, or this, it just creates an environment that marginalized people aren't comfortable participating in. Therefore, if you want to have a truly free and open marketplace of ideas, you need to be comfortable removing the bad merchants. I remember when Andrew Tate got banned, and there were a lot of people who were questioning whether his ban was justified. And while I would love to live in CoffeeZilla's world where simply talking to Tate is enough to reverse the damage he's done, it's not. Banning Tate was one of the biggest W's that Twitter took in a long time. And then this dummy decided to unban him. With this pair of tweets, Elon shifted Twitter towards a more hands-off style of moderation. It led to offensive videos on people's timelines, the dissolution of Twitter's Trust and Safety Council, and Twitter lost 90% of its value. And this whole commitment to free speech is just because Elon thinks that Twitter is the de facto town square. I mean, is it? The main difference between Twitter and the old town square is that on Twitter, conservatives are oppressed. And I mean, well, yes, they're posts do get massive boosts in the algorithm, their free speech is being unfairly limited. If you're a conservative, you're definitely going to get banned just for using your Twitter account like anyone else. You just tweet about, you know, walking your dog, what you're going to make for dinner, how you're going to overthrow the free world, and what you think about tax policy, you're going to get taken off that platform. And thanks to the 99 cents version of Tony Stark, Twitter is transformed into a place that is free for all to express their opinion, including this cast of usual suspects. He also unbanned Kanye, and I think we all remember how that one turned out. Elon actually texted Kanye when he reinstated his ban. In this image, you can kind of see the duality of Kanye. You see, throughout his career, Kanye has found ways to say things that are true while doing it in a way that is completely out of line. Hey, good morning, Kanye. Shut the up. The other side of this duality is that sometimes he's just out of line. In this case, Kanye dropped an absolute banger. Who made you the judge? is a very dumb question if you go by logic because Musk owns the company, but morally, it's kind of a great point. Elon has taken the time out of his day to personally ban journalists, to censor information for the Turkish dictator, and to sell out a protesting user to the Saudi government. So if you're trying to protect free speech, great job. 
Elon has altered Twitter since taking over, but not so much in favor of free speech, more so in favor of speech he favors. You see, Elon made a change to Twitter that takes the headline away from news articles, so people were tweeting literally anything and claiming that that's what the news article said. And that's when this tweet was posted that claimed that Elon Musk was a enjoyer of Subway sandwiches. And is it true? I mean, the community notes say it is. But is it funny? Yes. If Elon was as committed to free speech as he says he is, this post would still be up. But it's not. It got taken down. Along with her account. And her other account. Another thing Elon Musk decided to do was suppress the speech of people who aren't in his paying simp army. In another example, Elon Musk once saw that both he and Joe Biden tweeted about the Super Bowl, but Joe Biden got more interaction on his tweet, so he decided to change Twitter's algorithm to boost his posts. Another thing that Elon decided to do was suppress the speech of news organizations because sometimes they call him a dumbass. Literally all three of those things that I just said are things that conservatives think is happening to them online, and yet they celebrate his actions. This kind of thing is called projection, and it's definitely not the only example I've seen of conservatives doing it. I don't know how many examples I would have to give to firmly prove the point that Elon Musk is not a free speech advocate. He's a free speech hypocrite. There's so many stories that I could have included about Musk's behavior as the head of Twitter. In fact, I'll put some of them behind me right now. But if you want to understand everything about whatever new thing Elon is on about this month, just locate where he is on this graphic. But for the rest of this video, let's pretend that Twitter's actually dedicated to free speech because they're losing millions of dollars because of it. Seems like with how overregulated these platforms are in terms of speech, the first one to, you know, loosen their restrictions would attract a lot of new users. However, the problem with unrestricted free speech is that the people who are actually using your site, the people you care about, your customers, the real users, don't want to appear next to Tate's speech with Andrew Tate. And when Twitter decided to stop regulating its platform, the backlash from advertisers was swift. Apple has mostly stopped advertising on Twitter. Do they hate free speech in America? What Elon seems to not understand is that by making Twitter into a right-wing hellscape, he shifted Twitter from the middle of the Overton window to the edge of it. And advertisers don't want to place ads here they want to place them here. You see, companies are like Lakers fans. They only want to go to the game if their team is winning. They just want to take whatever position is popular with the people they're selling their product to. This is clearest if you look at the Twitter accounts that don't rebrand in June. I mean, just look at the brand accounts for the Middle East. I mean, the only rainbow that's going on out there is in the refraction of BP's latest oil spill. And the second that these companies calculate that they'll make less money by supporting gay people, they'll leave. Hell, I don't actually give a shit. Gay or not, you're all just a bunch of big old money mouths. I really want to hate this duality, but I can't. I mean, they're so transparent in their own self-interest, I kind of respect it. I can't hate him. He is so transparent in his self-interest that I kind of respect him. You see, Twitter is first and foremost a business, which is defined here as something your daddy's apartheid money buys for you. Wait, that's not right. A business is something that exists to make money. That is Twitter's purpose. And the problem with being a business relying on advertisers for your bottom line is that what you allow on your site is going to be dictated by what advertisers are okay appearing next to. And advertisers don't want to be plastered on alt-right content. Which is kind of a shame, because these people will believe fucking anything. Now, some would say that this proves that any corporation that relies on advertisers for income could never be the bastion of free speech that Elon dreams of making Twitter into. And those people are right. To solve this issue, Elon is trying to get everyone to pay $8 a month for Twitter, which is a great plan if you've never been on Twitter. And this kind of backlash might have caused you or I to, you know, take Twitter back to the old model, but that's because we are poor. You don't get to be the richest man in the world by listening to facts, logic, and other people. You get there because your father owned an emerald mine. Like, be honest with me, how many of you are on YouTube Premium? Like, none of you. That shit's $18.99 a month. Do you know how many pairs of socks I could get for that money? And I know it says purchase five times, but you know what? I don't have a problem. You have a problem. And that problem is that your feet aren't comfy. 
If you're a US citizen, your right to free speech comes from the First Amendment. And I mean, it doesn't take the spiffing Brit to see the loophole here. Anyone who's not the government doesn't need to respect your right to freedom of speech. These people get fired all the time. And while it says the government shall make no law, let me tell you, the government do me making those laws. There are so many restrictions on free speech, which is limited in the case of obscenity, defamation, fraud, incitement, fighting words, and speech integral to criminal conduct. Don't worry, I'm a legal eagle viewer. I know that hate speech is currently protected under the constitution, but the key word is currently. All these carve outs to the first amendment were created by the Supreme Court out of necessity. And the definition of the amendments to the constitution has always been changing. Let's put a pin in that. After editing that part and watching it back, I realized that part of it was lacking. I failed to clearly state my point. There have been many Supreme Court cases that have affirmed that we have a right to hate speech. However, we're okay limiting our speech in all of these categories. The point is that when we pass legislation to limit speech that causes harm to people, it's a natural part of living in society. But when we pass legislation to limit speech that causes harm to people that aren't white, it's a civil rights violation. The paradox of tolerance states that if a society is tolerant without limit, its ability to be tolerant is eventually seized or destroyed by the intolerant. While it's not hard to guess which society this quote was written about, I think it's very applicable to our online spaces. If you don't look like me, unrestricted hate speech makes it harder for you to participate. And if you aren't okay with that fact, you'll get pushed out too. If you want a tolerant experience online, you have to be okay with the fact that some speech is not okay. Case in point, kick. Twitch has been the leading live stream platform for at least a decade, and they've got a reputation for inconsistent moderation, favoritism, and bias, which to be fair, is completely accurate. The community would be interested to hear more about how Twitch gives one streamer a long suspension, but not another who does the same thing. Uh, how does it seem like Twitch applies the rules unfairly? So we apply our rules very consistently. It's just frequently using data that the community can't see. Yeah, again, more myths busted. <laughs> You serious? They claim they're working with data and other stuff in the back end, and that's what results in their erratic behavior. But to quote my math teacher, if you don't show your work, you didn't do it. In 2022, Twitch finally did something that they should have done years before and banned gambling content. This caused online casino Stake to found a new site called Kick that would compete with Twitch. Kick's numbers aren't transparent, but it's definitely run at a loss as a way for Stake to advertise its services to young kids but they're not stupid. They know that nobody would go to a site just for gambling streams. So they looked at their biggest competitor and noticed that one of the biggest complaints the user base has had was about the unfair moderation. So they decided to hook in those disillusioned viewers by just becoming the inverse Twitch. Anything that Twitch didn't allow, they would. Following an investigation where it was revealed that Kick was allowing the live creation of CP, Charlie said this. Yeah, I don't get it, man. They just allow actual illegal shit to be broadcast on their site proudly, and it's now just become the entire image of the platform. It's like going to a zoo and just pointing at all of the exhibits and just being like, ah, oh, that's interesting. But it's no surprise that this happened to Kick after it announced itself as a platform with lax rules. Because this happens to every platform with lax rules. If you own a platform, you should have a clear picture about what it should look like in your head and then moderate it into that image. When Elon first took over Twitter, he clearly had this idea in his head that he could just rush in, guns blazing, and zip zap zop, and all the problems in Twitter would be gone. But there was a lot of thought behind Twitter's old, flawed systems. It's actually a pretty popular theory among experts that if Elon's Twitter is to survive, he might have to revert every single change he made. And he did it all for his idea of free speech, which has never been what he thinks it is under the Constitution. Okay, time to take the pin out of that. If you've taken a US government class, you probably might have noticed that all of the carve outs to the First Amendment were from Supreme Court cases that happened within the last 100 years. And that's because we've changed how we've interpreted our rights under the Constitution. In Federalist Paper Number 84, Hamilton argued that something like the Bill of Rights was wholly unnecessary because the Constitution itself guaranteed the rights of the people. 
He said that by defining rights in writing, it could not only lead to misinterpretation of what those rights are, but also an endangering of any rights not explicitly written into the Constitution. This fear was shared by the other Founding Fathers and actually turned into the often forgotten Ninth Amendment. The Founding Fathers put our rights into two categories, natural and positive. Natural rights were basically things that you would have the right to, even if the government didn't exist. And positive rights are our rights within the government. At the same time, the Founding Fathers also universally agreed that natural rights could be restricted for the sake of public good. And while today's interpretation of the Constitution empowers us as individuals, I think we've lost sight of the power that we've lost as a collective. We can't regulate against the speech of bad actors even though stopping these people from speaking would definitely be in the interest of the public good. We can't go out in public without risking our lives because of an asinine reading of an amendment about militias. We cannot ban malicious misinformation. Think about how many people are dead because our collective interest is unable to overpower the rights of a small group of bad actors. A common objection to this way of thinking about restricting speech for the public good is always, where do you draw the line? And take it away, John. First, as I've said before, the answer to where do you draw the line is literally always somewhere. You draw it somewhere. And because a century of court decisions have made us unable to draw the line ourselves, it's left these tech companies to make the call by default. And when they do so, remember that they will always always make the decision that makes them the most money. We're just lucky that the decision that makes them the most money is keeping alt-right people out of their airspace. And thus, the last line of defense between our well-regulated spaces and the hellscape that is alt-tech is advertisers' belief that appearing next to alt-right content will make them look bad. And I mean, how bad could appearing next to alt-right content make you look? Hundreds of white nationalists protesting plans to remove a statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Hunger got you looking like this? Make sure to pack up before you head out. Jet puffed. It's the second softest white thing at your protest. As to the fifth count of the information, Gage Grosskreutz, we the jury find the defendant, Kyle H. Ritt Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. This not guilty verdict is brought to you by GM. GM, we also didn't go to jail for killing two people. Wait, how many people? This insurrection is brought to you by Tampax. Tampax, we also want to get into you. Use code don't hang to save one pence at checkout. Because of all these financial troubles, there's really only one alt-right platform I could see surviving another couple of years. They've just raised $350 million and have immediately started pushing their most loyal viewers into the gutter. It was originally supposed to be part of this video, but the story of Rumble was so complex, interesting, and hilarious that it required its own video. And if you thought these platforms were crazy, you haven't seen anything yet. Click here to learn about YouTube's evil twin brother, Rumble.